I, I want to be authentic. I, I don't want to pose for anyone. I don't want to posture for anyone. I, I don't want to appear to be something that I'm not. And I don't want you to either. up in a church, I think I've shared this with you, good church, good people, found the Lord there. One of the things that was really a battle in my church, though, was it was really externally focused. I remember the day that I found out that a man in our church <gasps> smoked. <laughs> now, I think that smoking, like anything, is an addictive thing. I think it's not healthy. I, I, don't, I wouldn't commend that to anyone. But somehow that external thing, that one thing was the most awful thing. And, 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 and what, what about other sin? What about all the other sin, you know? And I, in my church, it was like the filthy five, you know? We don't do these five things. Yeah, what about all the things you do do you're not supposed to do? And what about all the things you're supposed to do you don't do? And, and I just remember growing up with such a sense of scrutiny. I want to I show you a little illustration of this. It's very personal, and you'll think it's funny, but it isn't at the end. Back, back in the uh, mid-1980s, did you know that I went on a game show? Did you know that? I did. I was on the $25,000 pyramid in, in the, with Dick Clark in the mid-1980s. Want to see a little clip of it? Yeah. All right, here it is. This is James McDonald. James, they tell me uh, you're not our usual run-of-the-mill contestant. What is your line of work? Well, I am a minister to single adults at Arlington Heights Evangelical Free Church. I am a part-time student at Trinity Divinity School in Deerfield, originally from London, Ontario, Canada. How do you have time enough to play the pyramid? I mean, Well, I have my wife videotape and I watch it in a spare moment. There you go. All right, you can practice there and come here and win the money. We... I didn't win any money, but... <laughs> <laughs> But, but here's, here's the thing, and I could show you the clip of this, but I won't because it's so embarrassing to me, and for years my family teased me about it, but it'll give you a little insight into what, and you probably know what I mean when you feel the scrutiny. As I was playing the game, I had to, you know how it goes, you try to get the person to say a word, and you say a word, and you try to get them to say the word, and the word that I had to try to get the uh, person from, you know, the other the person on the game show, the movie star, whatever you call them, the word I had to try to get them to say was um, the word revolution. Well, if I'd been brought up in the United States, I would have said, you know, the American, the war, would have given the date, and, which I can't even think of right now, and because <laughs> and, uh, I would have all that American history. I didn't have that, so the only thing I could think of, and you're under the pressure of the moment, you know, when the real you comes out. And so the only thing I could think of was that Beatles song that has the word revolution in it. I said, you know that Beatles song you say, you wanna na 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 And the person didn't get it. <laughs> so we had to move on. That's not the thing. At the end of the thing, when we were done that little section, Dick Clark looks at me, a pastor, in 1987, and he says, oh, so we have a real Beatles fan here, huh? And I gave first my genuine response, I went. And then right in the moment I thought, all the things went rushing through my mind of all the people watching this show and all the people seeing me say that I was a real Beatles fan and na 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 And I went like this, I went, yeah. Nah. <laughs> and to me it's such a portrait of what I was struggling with, of what we struggle with, about what it feels like to be a person who wants to be genuine, who wants to be sincere, who wants to be authentic, but the immense pressure of other people to conform, to meet their expectations, to look the part, to not do, not have anything about you that anyone could criticize. It's an awful, awful way to live. And I'm dreaming a better dream for our church than that where we're petty, silly things about which the Bible does not even explicitly speak, but about which Christians so often have such strong opinions can separate us and pressure one another into some kind of external conformity that doesn't reflect our heart and doesn't please or satisfy God. So if we're gonna be authentic, let's start with that. I cannot please everyone. I just can't. Of course, I preached a whole message on this from uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 2 that where Paul says, to me it is a small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time, for the time will come to light when the Lord will uh, bring out the hidden things of darkness. Then each one's praise will come from God. And every time that uh, teaching, I, uh, freedom from people pleasing, goes on the radio, I mean, you just, people just call in, I have to have that. It's where a lot of us have lived our lives trying to please other people, trying to meet their expectations. It leads to hypocrisy. 
I cannot please everyone. Now notice from Matthew 6, 16, just across the page, jot this second thing down. I gotta tell you the truth. God despises hypocrisy. I mean, it would be hard for me to even uh, frame language that could clarify for us how incredibly God hates hypocrisy. And notice with me, uh, Matthew chapter six, verse 16, he says, and when you fast, you know what fasting is? It's like, um, it's like uh, willingly, uh, voluntary abstinence from food to heighten uh, spiritual desire. That's what it is. And some people, when I'm going through a difficult season, I abstain from food to heighten spiritual desire. Voluntary abstinence from food to heighten spiritual desire. And so when he's, uh, the Pharisees did it sometimes even as much as once a week, they were very devout. Fasting's used 70 times in Scripture. Here it says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. So here they've been fasting all week, and, and it was supposedly for God, but then they come to church, and they're singing like, I love you, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> And they're, they're like, kind of like grimacing in pain. And do, do you see me over here? Do you know why I'm in pain? Do you know why? Because I've been fasting all week, okay? That's how much I love God. How's it going for you? You know, that's what's going through their mind. You know, do you see me over here? Because I am so spiritual. I don't know if y'all have figured this out, you know? And, and he's just like, God's so not into that. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. He's like, you know what? Amen, truly, amen. They have the reward. Is that what you're going for? That's what you're going for? The people to pat you on the back and say how spiritual you are? You know what? Great, you got that now. Truly I say to you, they have the reward. When you fast, it's an illustration, of course, of all spiritual things. When, when, you, when, you, when you do your righteousness, when you seek to serve God, anoint your head and wash your face. In other words, take a, have a shower, clean up a little bit, so people are like, wow, you look like you had the most amazing week. You've been living on Easy Street. And God will know the truth about the way that you've been seeking him with your whole heart. No one will know, God will know. And, and, and notice the promise. When you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who's in secret, oh, pardon me, but uh, by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. God will reward you. God knows what you do. God, God sees all of those things. You don't need to, well, I don't know if anyone really appreciates me. I don't know if anyone really sees what I do. I don't know if anyone really comprehends all the kind of effort that I'm putting in. God knows. A better plan is to hide your service from other people's eyes. God will see it. God will reward you. Yes, he will. You're like, James, I, I kind of have a hard time believing that just because I struggle with not being appreciated by other people, that God's gonna keep my reward from me? I mean, maybe he'll be disappointed with me, but I mean, I mean, is it really that big of a deal, this little bit of hypocrisy? Well, here's what I wanna do. Um, why don't you turn your Bible for a minute over to, keep your finger there, and turn over to Matthew 23. And I wanna show you a passage of Scripture that if you've never seen it before, this, is a pas this passage of Scripture is written to church people. This passage of Scripture is for people like you and me who, who work hard at doing right things but can over time, if we're not careful, be guilty of doing the right things outwardly, but our heart's not where it needs to be. And uh, I want to just play a portion of Scripture. You can listen to the audio and uh, observe this portrayal of uh, Matthew 23, uh, let's just watch it together. And you pick up Jesus' heart about hypocrisy. He's talking to the Pharisees, he's talking to the churchgoers, he's talking to the Bible people. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! Right from verse 13. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides! You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools! 
Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Woe to you! Teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides! You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee! First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then! the measure of the sin of your forefathers. You snakes! You brood of vipers! How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. You know, it's um, shared with you in that format to help you get a sense of the immense intensity with which God hates the hypocrisy in us.
But see, hypocrisy is the kind of thing that starts off as a crease, then it becomes a crack, and if neglected, it becomes a canyon in me. The difference between what I say and do and what I really am inside. If you're thinking, how did I end up here? My life isn't what I wanted it to be. Then it's time for a change. You see, if you want your life to be different, you need to make choices that will lead to different places. The 10 Choices Bible Study is about the transformation God has proven He can bring when you follow His prescription for life. This study can be yours for your gift of any amount to walk in the Word. If you feel the weight of making bad decisions, if you fear that nothing can turn your life around, if you're ready to make choices that bring help and hope to you and those you love, get this study in your hands, open your Bible, and allow God to guide you through 10 of the most crucial choices you can make. And to make your personal study even richer, call right now with your gift of $90 or more and order the 10 CD teaching set as a companion to the written study guide. Choose now to exert some focused attention, followed by deliberate action, and you will quickly reap the benefits of better choices. I just love the idea that people can learn. Look, it's what I choose. I can't blame it on others. It's, it's not circumstances because other people are in the same situation as me and they're doing better than I am. I want to do what I can do and what I can do is I can choose. That's what we're all about here. Begin your journey to better choices. Call 800-545-6800 or go to jamesmcdonald.tv right now. And God forbid that we would watch something like that and think to ourselves, you know, boy, they really or she really or I wish he was here or, you know, um, but to look inside at ourselves. A couple of really key themes that are coming out in that passage. One of them is inside, outside. What's outside, what's inside. What's outside, what people see, what's really inside me. And, and, and that that needs to be a closing gap over the course of my life. But see, hypocrisy is the kind of thing that starts off as a crease, then it becomes a crack, and if neglected, it becomes a canyon in me. The difference between what I say and do and what I really am inside. And so Jesus is going over there. Inside, you're like this. Outside, you're like this. But inside, but, but, but outside, that, that needs to be narrowing. I need to be more and more the same inside and outside, not with a greater, greater a difference. So that theme's in Matthew 23, inside, outside. Another theme that's there uh, that's very hard to miss, verse 4, verse 15, or pardon me, uh, verse 16, 17, 19, 24, and 26, all say, uh, blind, you're blind, you're blind. Now, you, you'd, ne you'd never slap a person for being blind, right? And, and uh, so, so to accept the fact, look up here, I don't even have the capacity to discern the degree to which this is true of me. I can't even see this about myself. So your sense right now in this moment of how much you do or don't need this challenge is completely lost on you. I'd like to suggest that this is a far greater issue in each one of us than we are even capable of discovering on our own. And that's why we come to church, because we need a messenger to hold up the mirror of God's Word and say, this is a problem. This is a problem, and it's not, not a problem because you don't sense it is. You need someone else to speak into your life. You need someone else to tell you. You need someone who knows you and loves you and cares about you to say, hey, you might want to give some thought to the growing gap between what you profess and what you practice. What people see, but what God knows you are. See? And um, it's very serious, very serious. Hypocrisy is what we want to leave behind. If we don't give great attention to it, the gap only grows. I mentioned already the church that Kathy and I grew up in, and uh, it comes up again in this illustration of the most amazing family from another church like ours in the city I grew up in. There was five or six kind of like-minded churches, you know? And there was this one family in another church called the Bucks Bombs. They, they were so kind and rich, oh my goodness. These people were so rich. Uh, it said in the newspaper that he, he 
had this, uh, tw- this was in the mid-80s, he had a $28 million chain of nursing homes uh, that he owned. A guy came in the 1950s, came to uh, Canada with just the shoes on his feet and a few cents in his pocket. He had worked so hard, and these people loved God, so much so that every youth group in our whole city would go over to their house. I'll never forget the first time I went over to the Bucks Bombs house, and I went in and, and saw they had this indoor swimming pool and this arcade, and I'm like, I had never seen anything like this in my life before. I mean, I just couldn't believe. But the thing that was awesome was how generous they were and how kind they were. And so we'd go over with our youth group multiple times. In fact, uh, even when I was in college, I remember I remember one particular year that after the basketball season was over, our whole basketball team went over there for a big year-end party and everything, and, and, and the Bucks Bombs just very, very generous people. The summer after Kathy and I were married, I was working at, uh, at an assembly plant trying to make ends meet before uh, we could go into full-time ministry, and I was working at the Ford uh, uh, assembly plant uh, near my house, and I was uh, actually putting uh, car doors uh, on Crown Victoria, so if yours is a little messed up, if you have one of those, uh, <laughs> sorry. But it was a 10-hour shifts, night shift, not, a, not, not, a, not an easy job, I'll tell you that. Working in an assembly context, a lot of hard work. Some of you who do that, you have my highest respect. It's hard work, and I'll never forget the night that I walked into the cafeteria and was heartbroken. One of the, a couple of the men were sitting at a table, it was over lunch, and, and they were reading the newspaper, front page of the newspaper, that uh, Helmuth Buxbaum's wife, Hannah, had been murdered. And uh, he and she were driving home from picking up their nephew at the airport, and just like they would, they had stopped by the side of the road to help some people, and one of the gunmen had come, one of the men had come back when they were trying to help them and decided to rob them, pulled Mrs. Buxbaum out of the car by her hair, put three bullets into her head. I mean, just a tragedy. And, and uh, I just said, oh, this is awful. I know these people. They're the most wonderful people. I can't believe this has happened. I'll never forget when one of the guys looked at me and said, I don't know what you're talking about. That guy's a cokehead. I said, you don't know who you're talking about. These are the sweetest, kindest Christian people. I, he said, are you kidding me? That guy goes to more prostitutes than, I mean, everybody knows that. What's wrong with you? And I said, you are wrong, man, and you need to stop saying that. Within three or four days, it all came out. He was everything that guy said he was and a lot more. And he paid someone $25,000. The whole thing was a setup. He stopped knowing what those men were there. The whole thing was a setup. Those two guys in the car there were paid uh, by him. And uh, he went to prison, of course, for it. And uh, he just died November the uh, 7th. That's why I can tell you the story. And uh, look at this picture. This is uh, his gravestone. And if you could see it, if it was blown up, Helmuth Buxbaum died November 2007 after spending the last 20-some years in prison, died in prison, and there he is buried beside the woman that he arranged to have murdered. I didn't see it. Hypocrisy. A, A canyon between what he appeared to be and what he was. And that didn't happen overnight. That happened over a long, long, long period of time. And I want you to know something about me. I am marked by that. I'll never forget how sure I was and how wrong I was. It causes you to reflect upon yourself. I want to be authentic. I I don't want to pose for anyone. I don't want to posture for anyone. I I don't want to appear to be something that I'm not. And I don't want you to either. And I want our church to be a place where we can come and be real and honest. I mean, think about how many chances that guy had to say, I'm struggling. I'm not what you think I am. Someone help me. And every time he took a pass, he wanted what he wanted. He wanted to look one way. He has his reward. And he wanted to have what he wanted to have. Now, that is on a collision course with disaster. Man, I am loving this teaching. I choose to be authentic. Yeah, it's really exciting, and you know, but I feel the tension because you understand that these are messages that I gave in my church, right? 
And so because of that, it takes two or three programs to get through the whole thing. And I always feel the tension at the beginning because, you know, it's just to kind of get it started and sort of open up the need. And I always feel like the beginning, people are just like, where, where did that go? But listen, listen, set your DVR, come back to the program. If you miss it, watch it online, That's all good. right? It's one whole message, two or three programs. This one is about authenticity. God loves it. Grace rushes to authenticity, religion and posing and posturing, as we were saying. That's not getting us anywhere good. Let's, I hope that you find us to be that way. Yeah. You know, real and genuine yeah. and heartfelt and biblical. That's what we're going for. And we want you to join us there. If you're thinking, how did I end up here? My life isn't what I wanted it to be. Then it's time for a change. The 10 Choices Bible Study is about the transformation God has proven He can bring when you follow His prescription for life. This study can be yours for your gift of any amount to walk in the Word. If you fear that nothing can turn your life around, if you're ready to make choices that bring help and hope to you and those you love, get this study in your hands, open your Bible, and allow God to guide you through 10 of the most crucial choices you can make. And to make your personal study even richer, call right now with your gift of $90 or more and order the 10 CD teaching set as a companion to the written study guide. Choose now to exert some focused attention, followed by deliberate action, and you will quickly reap the benefits of better choices. Begin your journey to better choices. Call 800-545-6800 or go to jamesmcdonald.tv right now. All right, Dad, I got a tweet. You ready for it? I can't wait. Love tweeters. This one's from Dana. Thank you, Pastor James. I listen to your program on my iPhone app every morning before work. I can't tell you how the Holy Spirit has used it to help bring me out of depression and false guilt. And then as she finishes up by saying, you know, I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way there. And then this hashtag, thankful in Virginia. Well, Dana, we're thankful in Chicago that you're thankful in Virginia, and we're thrilled to hear from anyone who's reaching out to us on social media, just letting us know that God's using the ministry. And uh, let me just say that um, it really is encouraging when you take the time uh, to contact us and to know that she's listening on a podcast. Yeah. So lots of ways to get Walk in the Word on television, on the radio, on the internet, on podcasts. Um, and it matters not. The Word of God uh, is living and powerful and it is impacting lives today for God's glory. We're so glad to spend this time with you. This program was paid for by the friends and partners of Walk in the Word.